Hey guys, Keith here from Kegland and talking today about the new wrapped fermentation chamber. This would have to be the most exciting product release we've had probably ever. Honestly, this product is one that we've been working on for the last two years. It's finally completed and it's a total game changer. Because it's such a nice turnkey solution, it'll make making really repeatable, high quality beer or other beverages really easy for anybody who doesn't want to around making something from scratch themselves and just wants an easy product they plug into the wall and will do a great job at giving you great results of your fermentation. Now, I will say that it's not just for beer either. This will obviously be able to use for wine and other fermented beverages. You know, I'm sure commercially it'll have an application in yeast propagation. Even salami or meat curing, if you're somebody who gets into that type of stuff or making your own sausages. Uh, cheese making, yogurt making, you know, kombucha. Uh, we even had one customer contact us already about doing mushroom growing in this unit. So we're gonna modify the door and we have been talking to them about possibly having a kit which you can do humidity control with this unit as well. Another thing is you can even do bread leavening. Because it's got heating in there, you can go right up to you know, 30, 40, even 45, 50 degrees in this unit and use it for bread leavening and stuff like that too, which is really cool. The other thing is it fits quite a wide range of fermenters. So you can see in there right now, I've got the Firmzilla 30 litre all-rounder. This is one of the most popular fermenters that we sell. You could actually double stack these inside the fridge. You can fit as much as even one of these 118 litre keg menters. So if you wanted to max out this fridge, this is the largest fermenter that will fit in there. And excitingly, that's almost the type of size which you could get away running a brew pub or something like that. So to be able to buy a relatively inexpensive, you know, uh, chamber like this, buy a keg mentor, you could literally start a brew, brew pub with very little resources and do a fantastic job. Of course, it will fit things like the brew built fermenter or the larger firmzillas as well, or I'm sure a lot of the other fermenters that are out there in industry. Now, if you're looking at this product, you know, I bet you you've probably looked at other temperature control solutions as well. So you've probably already looked at possibly making one of these fridges up yourself. So getting an old fridge you've got sitting at home, putting a heating belt and a temperature controller on it. And certainly you can do that if you really wanted to. And we do sell the wrapped temperature control boxes if you wanted to make your own fridge like this and still take advantage of all the internet connected benefits of using our wrap portal. So that's a much cheaper option for those people who are pretty handy and want to save a few dollars. But if you want a turnkey solution, this is still the best option. The other thing I want to talk about briefly is the glycol chiller option. Because a lot of you guys at home probably have considered getting glycol and having used a lot of glycol chillers and even sold a lot of glycol chillers. We sell a lot of glycol chillers on our website through our dis distribution channels. And there are pros and cons. If you get a glycol chiller, certainly they, they can quite efficiently chill. And if you've got a compressor type, then yeah, generally they will go quite easily sub-zero. However, there are problems such as if you've got glycol, generally what you'll have to do is put some type of coil through the lid. So it means often penetrations through the top of the fermenter, uh, which is more stuff to clean, or it can be a glycol jacket around the outside of the fermenter. For instance, some have dimple jackets on the outside of the fermenter. Now, either way, you still have that slight inconvenience that when you have glycol inside a fermenter, eventually I'm going to get to the stage where I'm going to have to wash that fermenter and disconnect those hoses, in which case glycol will drain out of the jacket or the coil you've got on top. And it's just one more liquid that you have to deal with and there's wastage and it's a consumable product so you have to keep, up topping, keep topping up your glycol chiller with glycol fluid. So it's one of those slightly annoying things that I've never really enjoyed about glycol chillers. The other thing is glycol chilled fermenters often don't have as good insulation as what something like this will. So if you look at typically most of the glycol chilled options out there, they'll use either some type of insulated jacket to go over the fermenter or some type of neoprene jacket to go around. Now often that neoprene jacket, it covers most of the fermenter. However, you still might have some penetrations with you know, sockets and stuff stuff like that, or triclover openings coming through the jacket, which means more heat ingress, it means more uh, electrical inefficiencies and more power usage. But really, from a usage perspective, it has one other really annoying thing. A glycol chiller has a very cold glycol coil, and you, if you don't have fantastic insulation, you end up with hot and cold spots. That leads to convection currents, and that can sometimes cause you some issues with yeast falling out of 
suspension as quickly as well, what it should. If you've got the entire fermenter sitting inside a chamber like this, which has 40 to 50 mil urethane, polyurethane insulated walls, you've got much better insulation and the entire temperature of the fermenter is going to be much more even. So you don't get those convection current issues which prevent yeast from uh, settling out and clarifying the beer faster. So if you're trying to make clear beer, I really reckon this is a superior product in my opinion. But then when you look at electrical efficiencies, you know, it wins hands down. Now, as you would expect for any type of beer controller, we want to be able to set the temperature on the display. So I've got a graph on the uh, display here. There's a few other different displays that you can download or run on this as well. So you don't necessarily have to go with our stock standard graph display that you can see here. But yeah, I can set the temperature up and down like this. I can also put in a profile as well. So if I want to do that, I've already downloaded a couple of profiles here. So I click on start profile. And as you can see, I've got an IPA profile or Keys Vedant uh, profile as well for that Lullaman Vedant yeast. Anyway, if I click on that one, you can see in the profile, it's basically got a temperature graph here. And this is what the beer will follow as it ferments out. So I've got an 18 degree step at the start gradually building up to 24 and then it crash chills down to negative one. So, you know, it's nice that I can just play a recipe like this and it will just look after the whole fermentation process for me. Okay, so once you've got any of the wrap devices, the first thing you want to do is connect that to your Wi-Fi uh, internet connection because uh, without a Wi-Fi internet connection, you're not going to get the most out of the device. The second thing you want to do is make sure that not only that's connected to the Wi-Fi, but it's also connected to your particular wrapped portal login because you need to show that you own that device essentially on the portal. And that means you have to make a portal login. So go to app.wrap.io, so this website here, that'll take you to this particular website. So you can either sign in with Google or Facebook, or you can make a login with a conventional email address, which is what I've done here. So I'm just gonna log in like this. Now, once you've logged in, you can see all the devices that belong to you. Now, I've got a couple here. I've got the wrap fermentation chamber number one, and I've got this sort of test chamber, which is actually just a test fridge sitting next door, which we've been playing around a lot, which is why the graph is looking so weird. Um, but if you've got a new device, the first thing you want to do when you've made a login here is go to this add new device and add the device, and there's a registration process. And once you've finished that, that's when your particular device will show that it's owned to your profile login here. Now, in the future, you'll be able to share some of your devices with other people if you want to. So you'll be able to share this with friends so they can see what beer you're fermenting out at and stuff like that. And, you know, you can share tips or you can say, hey, Billy, what's going on with that uh, ale? Can I come around for a drink or whatever? But anyway, um, yeah, inside the profile is some really cool features that, uh, that you can use in here. So, for instance, with this test fridge next door, um, it's just sitting there doing nothing. And I can play around with the temperature and set this down, you know, 10 degrees, for instance, hit that set button and literally that has just sent a signal wirelessly to that fridge. So I can be on the other side of the world and you know just plug in a temperature and hit that. The other thing is I, I, can, I can do is change all the settings as well. So I can go in here and change the detailed settings and change, you know, turn the heating or cooling off for instance or change the hysteresis or compressor delay time and or telemetry frequency and so forth. Uh, so that's also kind of handy. But one of the real benefits, I think, with being a, have, being a being an internet connected device is you can start to have more complex uh, sort of algorithms and uh, and fermentation profiles that you can set. So in the future, when we have uh, interconnectivity with the fermentation chamber and the pill hydrometer, uh, you'll be able to, for instance, set a temperature profile dependent on what stage of the brewing process you're at based on the gravity inside the fermenter, which is kind of cool. But for the moment, I'm just gonna show you a simple temperature profile, which I've got up on the screen here. So this is my uh, you know, fermentation chamber that I've got at home in the garage, for instance. And as you can see, there's a black line here, which shows the target temperature. And then I've got a blue sort of blob here or, or, or um, you know, solid section here, which has a blue line. And that is tracking that black line because this is the actual temperature. So you can see in real time, I've got up to this stage on the graph. And very soon, uh, the temperature is about to drop down to 14 degrees. So I've got a hop step in this particular recipe. And you can see the temperature was set at uh, 20 degrees. 
uh, sorry, 18 degrees, 20 degrees, 22, 24 degrees, and just is about to step down to 14, which, which is the temperature I normally add my dry hops before doing a crash chill, and then it will just hold this temperature at negative one degree indefinitely. So as you can see, it's following the graph uh, fairly tightly. It's within one degree tolerance here of the set temperature. Obviously, I can go in and set the parameters on this and uh, reduce the temperature hysteresis if I want to follow it more tightly. But obviously, that'll come at a bit of a cost because it means I'm turning on my compressor and heating device more frequently. And, you know, not so much an issue with the heating device, but definitely uh, if I'm frequently turning the compressor on, I can be uh, reducing the life of that compressor. So... You know, I don't think it's really necessary to go too tight uh, with your cooling hysteresis in particular. Anyway, uh, if you want to use a profile, uh, one of the easy ways to do a profile like this is to just go to this profiles tab over here. And you can see there's a bunch of global profiles that we've already made. So this is the profile that I'm running now. Uh, because it's a global profile, these are available to everyone and we'll frequently update these for different yeast strains and stuff like that uh, over time. Or if you guys request us to put a new profile in here, um, you know, we'll, we'll go do that for you. Um, so if you hit this copy button, that'll copy this profile to your own library. Now, once it's in there and you got you have this profile in there, you can go edit that profile if you like. So instead of calling it Key's Favorite Vedant IPA Nipa Hazy Profile, you can say this is Billy's uh, Ale or whatever. And then you can make modifications to the different steps in here. So as you can see, I've got a four degree, 18 degree, uh, sorry, four day, 18 degree step, and it jumps up to 20 degrees for two days, and then 22, two, two days at 22 degrees, and then does a really high distal rest at 24 degrees. Um, and I've also got different alerts in here. So you can see how some of these steps that I've got in here, um, it's got a bell beside some of them. So if you click on that, you can actually see what the alert is. So in this instance, I have an alert set a few days in. Alert message, shake fermenter vigorously. This breaks up Krausen and, and assists with, and prevents uh, you know, yeast and clumps of other hops and what so forth getting blocked in the dip tube. So that's a handy little thing. I generally like to shake my fermenter a few days into fermentation just to keep breaking up all the Krausen. Uh, so I've put that alert in there to remind myself to do that. Now, you can set the alert to, at a particular time of day if you want, but I haven't bothered. Um, so that will just go off at uh, two days after whenever that you know alert was set. Um, the other thing is you can easily change any of the steps in here. So I could say, you know what, I actually don't think this is that good. I'm going to change this to, you know... 21.5 degrees or something like that and modify um, any of the profiles that you have in there. Eventually, you'll be able to share profiles with friends too. Um, yeah, so once you've got a profile running, uh, going back to uh, the dashboard here on the device, you can zoom in and get a better idea of how well your device is operating as well. So if I click on the magnifying glass here, I can go back in time so go back a year and you know I can for instance see what that winning recipe is that I entered at Vic Brew and then see what temperature profile I use because I want to replicate that on my next brew for instance or I can check things like compressor utilization so this is how much the compressor has been turning on so if I hit this sort of checkbox here you can see that it shows me compressor utilization on the graph as an over overlay so this is perfect. What I can see here is, look, it wasn't cooling much. It's uh, you know middle of winter in Melbourne, so as you can imagine, the compressor's hardly turning on. Uh, overnight temperatures dropping sub 10 degrees uh, Celsius, um, and as a result, the compressor, you know, for one day here was up at about almost 20% duty cycle. So nothing to be alarmed at. However, if I did see this and it would start to peak at 100%, then that would be a good alarm that my compressor is on a lot of the time and I might need to look at improving ventilation. Maybe I've left the fridge door open. Or I've got the fermenter pushing up against the fridge door so it's open a lot of the time, letting all the hot air in or something like that. And I can do the same thing for heating utilization too. Now, because it's in the middle of winter, you know, the heating's been on a lot more. So you can see this overlaid graph here, especially when the temperature is increasing. I've got a large 60 litre fermenter in this particular fermentation chamber. So when I'm stepping up the temperature from this 18 degrees to 22, to get it up to that hotter temperature, you can see there's the, the, the heating utilization is almost at 100%. So don't be alarmed by this. The heating device that we put in there is only a 50 to 100 watt 
heating element. So it's not a super powerful one. And intentionally, we've done that because we don't want people to be um, heating too aggressively. We want a nice gentle heat inside the fermentation chamber. So if you see the heating on 100% of the time, that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to see all that utilization. The other thing is we've also got Wi-Fi signal strength. You might find this handy for problem shooting if the Wi-Fi drops out for some reason in your house or you notice that for some reason you lost um, you know, a bit of data or something like that, you'll probably notice also this Wi-Fi connection drop down to zero or something. So it does make it really easy for problem shooting. And also if you've got a house with a particularly bad Wi-Fi connection, it'll become very evident that you need to buy another repeater um, or access point that you need to install into your house closer to wherever the fridge is located. So um, yeah, that's another handy little feature you might look, in, look at at some stage. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the wrap portal. We're doing lots of work uh, on the portal itself, as well as doing firmware updates on the device. So if you've got any tips for us or you want to see anything change, please let us know. Send us an email. And because we're actively working on this code quite a lot, you will notice lots of updates over time. So when you buy the wrapped fermentation chamber, you do get a couple accessories included. You can see you've got the heavy duty fridge shelf. Now this particular type of fridge shelf, it's different to your standard fridge shelf because we have this sort of truss, truss support shape here. That's what enables us to hold quite a lot of weight. So this fridge shelf, it's rated to 60 kilos and so are the pockets on the side wall of the fridge here as well. So they're really heavy duty. So you can put a 60 kilo fermenter on here or that's uh, what over about 120 pounds or so. The other thing is we've got a, a little plastic floor protector that you might want to put down. So if you've got, uh, for instance, maybe a uh, big stainless steel fermenter that you're sliding around, you don't want to damage the plastic on the floor of the fridge, you might want to use the floor protector. Another couple accessories you might want to think about as well is the plastic trays. So if you're using this for, say, bread leavening or something like that, you might want to get some of these custom injection molded plastic trays which slide in like so or some people have already started to ask us can this be used for wine storage and definitely it can um, as I was saying before you can buy much more expensive wine fridges of a similar size and they don't even have the internet connected connected ability and these ones have much more control as heating and cooling can go much colder than a lot of wine fridges so I'm sure there'll be people who want to get the wine racks to turn these into wine storage fridges too. Now fermentation can be a bit of a messy business and inevitably the day will come where you spill stuff all over the insides of the fridge. One of the nice things about this design is firstly we've got a relatively flat surface uh, all the way to the back of the fridge so no hump or step where the compressor normally goes. It's pretty much flat with a very slight grade to this drainage hole at the front of the fridge. So that means you can get in here and wash it all out quite thoroughly and then it'll wash down into this larger than normal drainage hole. Now once it goes down that hole, you can remove the magnetic cover off the front of the unit like so. And then you've got a waste bin under here. So you can literally take that out, tip it in the sink and then put this waste bin into the dishwasher. So cleaning the fermentation chamber has never been easier. Now pretty much everyone these days is talking about pressurized fermentations and the reason why is because it's so much easier to keep oxygen off the beverage with a pressure rated fermenter but you can also do other cool stuff if you have the ability to crash chill the fermenter like these ones can, these these fermentation ch chambers can go down to negative five so I can easily crash chill the fermenter get it down to carbonation uh, types of uh, temperatures where I can force carbonate the beer transfer finished beer out of the fermenter into bottles, cans, or even into keg, or I can actually drink it directly from the fermenter. So all this kind of cool stuff can be done. The other thing you can do is also attach spunding valves. So things like our blow tie spunding valve, and then control the pressure or the CO2 that is coming out of the fermenter itself, therefore retaining some of that CO2 in solution and having a carbonated beverage at the end of the fermentation process without the need for a gas cylinder. So one of the things that we were trying to achieve in the design objectives when we made this fridge is to make sure people didn't have that hassle of having to drill holes in the side of the unit. So a lot of people who are making you know, these types of fermentation chambers themselves out of fridges, they'll have to drill holes in the walls. Therefore, they may have a risk of hitting things like refrigeration lines. 
or they may just have a very, really ugly job of making holes and stuff like that. So we wanted to make sure that was as simple as possible, which is why on the top of the fridge we've got panels here, so little inserts here which you can remove and then fit up things like the blow tie or for instance the inline regulator. So I'm going to show you how these guys fit into the top of the fridge. So if you want to run a gas line into the fridge or a spunding valve line out of the fridge, this is the place to start on top of the fridge. Just remove this cover panel here. Then you'll also see there's a couple of uh, Phillips head screws here. So you just need a Phillips head screwdriver for this job. One screw on top. And then if you look inside the fridge, the one closest to the fridge itself, there's another Phillips head screwdriver, screw, screw head there. I'm gonna undo that one. Then this side panel here will actually just slide sideways and lift out. Now, once I've got this out, I can undo two screws here and here. And then I can remove this little cosmetic uh, wrap cover on the front there, so just put that aside. And now what I can do is fit this digital regulator. So I'm actually using the digital one. I've upgraded the analog one to a digital display here. So I can click that one and this one also has kind of a nice little illuminated display as well. So I'm going to mount this inside the top of the unit like that. Now I'm also going to show you that there's a few different mounting configurations. When you buy this fridge, it also comes included with some of these PCO threaded parts. The reason why we've done that is so you can quick disconnect your gas line off the side or the top of this unit. So you could just open this up and take one of these panels out and just run the gas line directly into the side through this big hole here. One slightly preferred option that I like is actually putting this unit on here. So that way I can put one of the carbonation caps on here and that way quick disconnect my gas line from the side of the unit. So that's what I'm gonna do. But if you did want to, let's say for instance, this side of the fridge was right up against a wall or something like that, then maybe you don't have the option for this side entry. So you can lift out the top panel and then you could put this into the top of the fridge as well. So you could have gas coming in from above. But for this particular demonstration, I'm gonna put it in the side here. Now I've already cut a short piece of beer line. I'm using the five millimeter by eight millimeter or the five sixteenths outside diameter. And the length of this is exactly 84 millimeters. So that'll save you having to measure it yourself. So I've got this uh, red carbonation cap. Then I've got the reducer, quarter inch to eight millimeter or quarter inch to uh, five sixteenths reducer. I'm gonna screw this onto the PCO thread, PCO 1881 thread. Then I've got my 84 millimeters piece of beer line I've got like that. Then put this into the regulator, making sure the regulator is the right way up. And that way this whole assembly now will drop into this unit. I might also attach the output piece of gas line at this stage as well to make it a little easier. Like so. And the other thing I'll do is get the other end of this gas line here and drop that down into the fridge. So you can see that there's a hole at the top of the fridge here and I can drop that in. Now that's going into the fridge cavity and the rest of this assembly I'm gonna slot into place like this. So this is just dropping into this section like that. And I'm gonna do up a couple of these screws to hold the inline regulator into place. Okay, then going on the other side. Okay, because I'm not using this hole, I'm gonna cover that one back up again. And as I put this on, I'm gonna drop this beer line into the channel, which is in the injection molding here. So I'm gonna drop that in like that. Oops. And then put these two screws back on top like so. And then to complete the process, just put this cover panel back on top like that. 
So that's how to set up the regulator on the left hand side here. As you can see, I've got a spunding valve on the right hand side. The installation is exactly the same, so I'm not gonna go through that in this video. The only thing you have to remember is some of the uh, units like this, you might have to rotate the direction of the gauge. So the spunding valve comes with this gauge facing upside down. So you have to undo these two screws and give it a 180 degree turn. Now you can see inside the fridge, I've got two lines here. So I've got one, this is the gas line leading to the regulator. So because it's a gas line, I'm gonna put the white or the gray ball lock disconnect on here. This is the one that hooks up to the gas inlet side. And then for this one, this is now gonna be my spunding line. I'm gonna hook a black disconnect. Now, technically a spunding valve could be a little bit of liquid. It could be gas arguably, but I'm just gonna use a black ball lock disconnect just to differentiate it from the other one so I don't get them confused. So this now hooks up to this line which runs through the spunding valve here. And now when I close the door, I don't need to run any lines through the door seal or door jam or anything like that. Everything's nice and contained. If I need to hook up a gas supply from my gas cylinder and regulator, I can just go onto the quick disconnect on the side of the fridge. And nicely, everything is displayed on the top of the fridge here. So no need to open up the door to check what the spunding pressure is or anything like that. I've got everything showing on the display. Now I also want to say the standard unit we have has the stainless steel brushed door and this is a foam filled door. So this is the most electrically efficient option because it has the best insulation. If you guys have a bit of stainless steel bling you really want to show off in your garage, you can upgrade this door to the glass door if you want to, but just be aware that the glass door does allow more heat ingress and therefore it's not going to run as electrically efficiently. The other thing is uh, having a glass door will let light in and if you've got a clear fermenter like this, which is great because you can see everything, you've got, the, uh, you've got the problem that you've got light coming in and possibly light striking your beer, striking your beer as well. The other thing I wanted to mention is doing a lot of software updates. So every now and then you might notice on the screen that we've got a firmware update and that'll get pushed onto the screen so you can confirm. Or the other thing is you can go into the settings and actually check if there's any firmware updates available for you. Because we're doing lots of updates, um, you know, all this cool stuff that we're bringing out in the future, which will be integrated with this unit, you know, all the units that we're bringing out now and all the older units we'll have, even if they get superseded by new models, we'll still do firmware updates for them. So, you know, that's something cool that you'll be able to take advantage of down the track. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you enjoy using this unit. I bloody love this thing. I think it's one of the best things since sliced bread and home brewing. Hope you guys enjoy it as well. Definitely, if you love this video, share it with a friend. Let them know about this cool new technology we've been working on. The other thing you can do that helps us is bottom right hand corner, subscribe to this YouTube channel or join our Facebook group and talk to a whole lot of customers just like yourself and share ship tips and tricks on how to get the most out of our gear. Anyway, that's it. Hope to see you guys next time. Bye.